Good morning. Are we live on, on YouTube this morning? Are YouTube up with us? I'm going to give them the wave just in case. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful. Well, good morning. Good morning. All good to go, Nigel? All good to go? Fantastic. Good morning. Give me a wave if you can see me. I see you. I see you too. And good morning, YouTube. Anybody who's watching from online from home, good morning. Lovely to see you too. Uh, and you can join in all the fun and the joy of this morning. There are scarves down the front. If you feel inclined to wave uh, some scarves, that would be great. But otherwise, Lord, let's, let's start off with a, a prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you that we can come together to worship with you uh, in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. better than worshipping God and having a good old sing. That's fantastic. Can I tell you a story? Back in 13 years ago, back in 2009, the year of the mud, we went to new wine camping and it was, um, well, it was hard. It was tough. It was all wellies. But actually, I've never seen so much joy in people. I think it was just the joy of survival, to be honest. But um, the, this was the, my first experience of a big worship venue. And I was used to, you know, normal church, so I sang along, but there were people 
dancing in the aisles. And I was like, ooh, what's that? And there were people jumping, and there were people with two arms in the air. I mean, I might have once done that. <laughs> um, but it was amazing. It released something in me in that year that I brought home, and I have never been ashamed to praise God like no one's watching. It's like in an undignified manner. That is what I, what I did. And there is a verse in the Bible in Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs and know that the Lord is God. For he who made us and we, for it is he who made us and we who are his. How amazing is that? Right, so we're going to, are you up for a sing-off? Yes, yes, thank you, Graham. Fantastic. Right, so I think we might do um, girls versus boys and children. Okay, so I'm going to need a bit of a beat. So, George, give me a look. That's it. So. Okay, very good. Now, what I want is the children are going to keep this beat up. And you might want to do this. It's quite hard. Excellent. And we're going to be singing this song which echoes women and men. Okay, so uh, when we do, when it comes to your bit, it's getting slightly fast, George, I think. It's a, oh, we're on a runaway train. <laughs> okay, we're doing this. Okay. When it comes to your bit, so it starts with the men. Graham, you're going to lead the men, aren't you? So watch Graham, men. Women, watch me. When it comes to your bit, I want you to respond with your, put your hand up as well at the same time. Actually, let's do two hands. Let's go for it. Two hands, right. So, Graham, let's I take I will worship. I will worship. With all of my heart. All of my heart. I will praise you. I will praise you. With all of my strength. All my strength. I will thank you. I will thank you. All of my day. Every time. 
going to go out to do their activities. And this morning, we are looking at joy. Have fun. Morning, Christchurch. Morning, Doug. What a wonderful start to our service, eh? Wonderful. Um, we have quite a number of notices today, so I'll try and do them quickly. Okay? So, ping back your log holes. What's happening? Tonight, prayer gathering, 7 o'clock in the Philippi. See you there. Uh, we look at a video of Pete Gregg uh, doing the prayer course, and then we pray. So come along tonight. Uh, New Wine is in two weeks' time. There is an online option, so you can watch it from your sofa. There is a fee, but it means that you can see all of the teaching. So if you're interested in that, ask me at the end. Next week in the evening, we have one of our 1426 evenings. And I think, Graham, if it's a bit like this, then we might have it in the garden, which is how it all started. Um, That'd be nice. So just lots of worship. And the 1426 is 1 Corinthians 1426. Bring along a hymn, a song, a word, and just share it for the building up of the church. Um, so that will be uh, next Sunday evening. Uh, our mission partner of the month is Mother's Union, and they'll be uh, coming and sharing with us next Sunday. So look out for that. Um, there is a show in November which is the line of which in the wardrobe. We have secured some tickets. They're £80 tickets for £30. Um, now, they only stay at that price for the next two weeks. So you don't need to pay now, but if you're planning on going, can you please let us know? Because we need to know that we can, uh, we can use those tickets So um, in, in the next two weeks. So if you're interested, <coughs> speak to me, speak to Jude. Um, and uh, so it's the line of which in the wardrobe, West End Show, £30 for an £80 ticket. There'll also be a coach if, uh, if people want to do that as well. Um, I'd advertise some ministry training, prayer ministry training. Uh, there were two dates. Everyone could do one of the dates, but not the other one. So we've deferred that. It's not going to happen this afternoon. We've deferred that until September. So look out for that. That gives more time for more people to join in as well. And uh, finally, the details of um, Olive Owen's Funeral are, it's, at, it's tomorrow, 1.45 at Croydon Crematorium, and Lisa will be leading that service. That wasn't too bad for that number of notices, was it? Yeah, a round of applause. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that was what the bishop said. I've never heard uh, notices be, uh, people applaud the notices in an installation before. Um, not sure we so impressed with length of the prayers, but never mind, we'll move on from there. So a very warm welcome if you are watching on YouTube and a very warm welcome to everybody this morning. We, uh, it is a communion today um, and we um, normally start with a confession. So I'm hoping the confession is going to come up on the screen in a moment. <coughs> Lovely. So let's just uh, take a moment and then we say these words together. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Now Jesus died on the cross to take our sins and that we may receive the forgiveness of our Father for all those who truly repent. Receive that forgiveness now in the name of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Now we will have our reading. Um, 
Um, morning. Uh, this morning's reading comes from 1 Timothy, and it's chapter 2, and you'll find it on page 1192, 1192 of the Church Bibles. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle, I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer, without anger or disputing. I also want women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. This is the word of the Lord. That was a very muted thanks be to God there. I think I heard sniggering while Roger was reading that. Alison said I wore uh, pearls as a, as a mark of... What was it you said? In defiance. <laughs> good luck, Ricker. <clears throat> so, good morning, everyone. Um, we're continuing our series on 1 and 2 Timothy, um, and we've got chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, uh, continuing from the last couple of weeks where we had that sort of background. Um, and so we are looking at, I titled it Worship when I put the, the series together. Um, I don't always read the whole passage when I come up with these titles, and so when we're talking about worship, we're specifically talking here about leadership about prayer, and about teaching. Joe Saxton, Nicola O'Neill, Lucy Pepiat, Christina Baxter, all women, all teachers. Rebecca McLaughlin, author and speaker, I've recently been reading uh, Confronting Christianity, which is a fabulous book, and I'm yet to read The Secular Creed, which I also expect to be a fabulous book, speaking into the conflict which we see in the church and in theology today. Another woman, another enriching experience. Our archdeacon was Rosemary Mallet. She is now our bishop. She has authority over me as, a, as incumbent. I both respect her, I learn from her, and we share the cure of souls. I trained with a non-stipendary curate called Kate. We worked together, we shared ministry, even in an interregnum when the vicar left, and that meant leading the PCC and things like that. Uh, your vicar leaving is the best learning experience, by the way, I discovered. We have a female curate, Lisa. I honor and respect and trust her as a colleague in the word and recognize her undoubted skills and gifts, as I'm sure many people here do too. I also seek to correct her in error, uh, that she might be a great servant in the Lord. I try to do so as I would any curate. I may not succeed, but that might be a sermon for Lisa to deliver at some other point. So verse 12. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. 
If we read the plain meaning of, of those words, then certainly at nine o'clock, people were flinching when it was being read out because it really grates against current day sensibilities. What is Paul, for Paul says he does not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. But does it? And what to do with this? The Church of England over 20 years ago made the decision that that is not how this was to be put in practice in the Church of England because women were first deaconed and then priested and then inevitably a few years later were made bishops. So how do we deal with this? Well, this is a great opportunity to look at how we deal with any tricky passages in the Bible. And so there are three things we can look at. Firstly, the context of the setting in which the letter was sent. So what was going on in Ephesus at that time. Um, we can look at the context within the overall biblical story and we can look at what that might mean for us today. Well, I've already alluded to what that might mean for us today. The plain meaning of those words is not how we receive them now. We believe in equality and we believe in partnership. Um, that's not always evident in every place, in workplaces or even in the church. But that is the principle which most people would, would apply. And so um, that's where we expect to land. I said to my daughter when I was telling her what I was preaching on today, I, said, I know what the answer is, I just haven't worked out my arguments yet. Um, that's actually poor theology, by the way. <coughs> we, we look at, uh, at what the Bible actually says, and from there we work out um, what the answer is. Now, I'm comfortable that where I'll land is where we should land, but we've got a bit of work to do to get there first. So the context of the setting, what was going on in Ephesus? Well, we did a little bit of this a couple of weeks ago, about three weeks ago, but I'd just like to present to you an imaginary letter that Timothy could have written to Paul. He didn't, so I've made this up. But this is what Timothy might have written to Paul, um, which would then lead Paul to write back to him. My spiritual father in Christ, greetings from Ephesus. It pains me to say that all you taught me is being distorted. What I say and what others say are in constant conflict. I honestly don't know what to do. The trouble is that some of it sounds plausible, but I know it not to be true to what you taught me. Teaching about how the law saves. Different ideas about Jesus. It feels like a constant battle. I'm not sure I know or others know truth from fiction. I and many others feel adrift, separate from God. All this talk of special knowledge and chosen people, it's unsettling. And we are surrounded by the practices of the world, selfishness, anger, greed, ostentation, materialism. The men in particular argue and spout hatred almost to violence. The women are so steeped in the local customs of Artemis they see the priestesses domineering and bossing around as if they own the place because they sort of do in the temple. You taught me, Father Paul, that we of the way should be separate from the worldly things, set apart, holy. My conscience is clear. I do best to live up to the standards, but those of riper years that I and of greater standing before I arrived, they follow these around and some who teach encourage them to do these things teachers men and women take it upon themselves to spout their half truths and pagan practices what can I do what might why might they listen to me who should lead with me and serve for me I write that you may instruct me as you have done many times over the years I am your servant, and you are my model. Guide me, your servant in Christ. Timothy. So that provides a little bit of background about what was going on in Ephesus at the time, where the, where the letter landed. 
So what was Paul's response? Well, we've already seen in chapter 1, he said this, stay in Ephesus, command certain people not to teach their false doctrine. And the goal of this is love, because these are drawing people away from God. Some people do not know what they're talking about. The law and sound doctrine conforms to the gospel about God's glory. I, Paul, can tell you that I received grace. So I'm telling you, Timothy, I command you to, to command others in line with the prophecies that were spoken over you. Fight well. And you should have faith and you should have good conscience. Let me repeat that. You should have faith and you should have good conscience. For some have shipwrecked regarding their faith. So in that first chapter we looked at over a couple of weeks, there's a real emphasis on character and integrity, which makes it a compelling message for this week, don't you think? And so what follows is a therefore, and he's about to go into the reading that we just had. But before we go there, I want to jump to chapter 3. And um, Simon will be preaching on this in a couple of weeks' time. Because in chapter 3, Paul gives the character um, requirements for a leader. An overseer is a noble task. You should be above reproach, faithful to your spouse, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not drunk or violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. Not have a love of money. Manage your fam uh, family well. Must not be a recent convert. Must also have good reputation. And then in verse 8, he says, in the same way, deacons, that is those who served, are to be worthy of respect. And then gives a similar sort of shorter list of what deacons should, uh, what their characteristics should be. And then in verse 11 says something really interesting. In the same way, the women, or the NIV translated wives, are to be worthy of respect. So in, within about three verses, Paul says the same thing about those who are serving in the church as deacons as he says about the women in the church. And the reasons for Paul's instructions, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. So Paul is very interested in the truth and doctrine. We know that from the last time. But he's interested in the character of those who are leading the church and those who are in the church. All of those, if you, we look at wider scripture, every single one of those requirements of a leader can apply to women as well as men directly. Not indirectly, but directly. You can go through uh, scripture and find that a woman would, would qualify under each one of those. So how can this be consistent with verse 12? Well, if we read backwards in our section and we start with the end of what Paul said, he's talking about the creation narrative. And that's an obvious place to talk about men and women because that's where we first find that distinction. And it says in verse 13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Now, when we first read that, it sounds like Paul is putting the blame on Eve for the fall. Does that, is that how it sounds to you? Well, let me read it to you again. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived. Okay. The woman was deceived by the serpent. She was fooled. She was tricked. And what did she do? She ate the fruit, which she wasn't supposed to do. What happens next in that narrative? Eve takes the fruit, eats the fruit. What does she do next? She gives it to Adam, and Adam eats. Now, we've just been told that Adam was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was rebelling against God. Eve thought, 
there wasn't going to be any consequence because that's what the serpent had told her. Does it start to sound a bit different now? Yeah? So actually, Paul isn't saying women are not worthy, shouldn't be put in leadership, men should because they're better or you know, more suited or more fitted. He's actually saying that both men and women failed at the fall, but for different reasons. And the primary reason that Eve failed is that she was deceived. Hold on to that thought as we go on to see what he says about women. He goes on to say, but women will be saved through childbearing. There is one uh, stream of thought that thinks that actually it says the childbearing, in other words, through Jesus, because Jesus, through, through the line, becomes a, a child of Eve. Um, that is possibly a distraction. But, and, but it goes on through childbearing. If they continue in faith, love, holiness, and propriety. Now, what it can't mean is that women are saved because they have children, because that is salvation by works, by what you do. So it can't mean that. But it does say if you continue in faith, love, holiness, and propriety. So it's about faith and it's about character, which is what we were saying earlier. So with that insight, let's look at the rest of the passage. There are problems in the Ephesian church, and Paul is, is, has written what he wrote in that first chapter, and he says, therefore, and he says, therefore, pray. I urge you then, first of all, that uh, petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all goodness and holiness. So the prayers are for everyone, and everyone in authority, men or women. And then it goes on in verse 3 and 4. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, men and women. He wants all to be saved, and he wants all to have knowledge of the truth. Eve didn't have full knowledge of the truth, which is why she was deceived. Does that make sense? For there is one God, one mediator, and so Paul says how salvation comes through our one God. And then he goes on to talk about himself. In verse 7, For this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle, He's a witness. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. And a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Paul was there to teach truth so that that truth would be passed on by the truth tellers. And Paul's instructions that flow from his call is to both men and women. His assessment of the men first is I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Because we know that they were all arguing amongst themselves and, you know, having ridiculous arguments. So he's saying to men, stop it. It's not helpful. And he says to the women, stop showing off. Because in that particular place, if you looked to the temple... You had the priestesses who were bossy and overbearing and probably adorned in all sorts of ways. And he's saying, you're Christians. You're not worshippers of Artemis. So stop showing off, but with good deeds appropriate uh, for women who profess to worship God. It comes back to character. And then as you read on, be very careful about people who say, oh, the Greek and Hebrew says, unless they really understand Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> it's an easy out to, to forget the Bible to say whatever you want it to say. But actually, when we come to uh, verse 11, it says, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. That is submission to God, not submission to men. 
That is the only imperative in the whole chapter. And an imperative is rather than a suggestion, is a must. A woman must learn in quietness. Just as Eve needed to learn to then resist the temptation if she was given. Because the women who are not learned would not teach the truth. He's not saying they shouldn't teach. He says, learn what the truth is first and then teach it. I saw uh, something on social media where somebody was going into a school as a, you know, from a church and they were asked to do some teaching about sex education, basically, to the children. And it was, I'm not sure I should be asked to do this. My response was, go to the uh, sex education teacher and say, you teach the Trinity first and then I'll take on this task. You need to know what you're talking about. So if the women in the Ephesian church didn't have that learning, it's fair to say you shouldn't be teaching. So Paul doesn't say don't teach. He says go and learn and then you can teach. Is that a different picture to the one we had when we heard it? I haven't convinced everyone. Or maybe it's just a bit hot, I don't know. But if you want to go into this in more detail, and literally the pages and pages and pages have been written about this in the Greek. Um, there's a, a blog, a Christian blog, uh, run by Ian Paul, who used to be one of my tutors, called Sephizo. And just recently, in the last few weeks, there's been an article there, 6,500 words. I measured it, I counted them, not one by one. I used the word. Um, and he starts out by saying complementarianism is in crisis. Complementarianism is the belief that men should be the leaders and the teachers and women should not. And he, he takes an, somebody who's put that argument forward and he basically looks at the whole Bible and comes to a different conclusion. He looks at biblical examples of which there are many of women leaders and teachers, Old Testament and New. He looks at the new creation and what that means for difference. He looks at biblical leadership and how that's described. And he looks at overemphasized difference rather than partnership. The whole idea of, um, the, uh, of Eve being a helper is that Eve and Adam were to co-partner in the stewardship of creation. It's not that Adam did and Eve helped and was ordered about. It's a co-partnership. So the key to what Paul is talking about here is character and spiritual qualities, whoever you are. It is not saying that men lead and women listen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this letter. And we know the difficulties that we have in interpreting it now because we weren't there to receive it then. And I thank you for those who put in the time and the knowledge and the expertise to interpret these things for us. And I pray that we go away from here being encouraged about the equality of God in God's kingdom for whoever we are. That God chooses us and calls us. And when he calls us, he doesn't look at whether you're male or female, tall or short, black or white, able or disabled. He calls us to a task and he equips us for that task. But what he asks of us is that we obey and follow his spirit to build the character of integrity and truth and faith that we may fulfill that task for him. 
Help us today to recognize the call in others that all may be built up. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let me invite Tosin to follow that. <laughs>
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels, praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit so that the broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you. He gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven through Christ and with Christ and in Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now we turn to the Lord's Prayer. We say this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. We say together the prayer after communion. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free. All earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> and the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. We close with our closing uh, song. And then just a reminder that we have our 11.45 service um, following this after coffee. If you're able, would you like to stand? My heart is filled with